Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to the Hall of Fame's author series here in the Bullpen Theater. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Bruce Markison. It's always my pleasure to introduce the latest author joining us for the series. This is program number three on the year. Uh, we didn't have these programs in 2020 or 2021 for obvious reasons, so we're very glad to be able to uh, bring them back to you. We have programs that will be taking place throughout uh, July and August as well. And in fact, on the small table out in the atrium, we do have a schedule of other authors. So for those of you, especially local, uh, you want to check out that entire schedule, we have that there for you. Uh, today, we are very pleased to be joined not only by you folks here in the Bullpen Theater, but also folks joining us on Facebook Live. Uh, today, we have the privilege of being with us, one of the leading authorities on Japanese baseball and its history. His name is uh, Robert Fitz, or Rob Fitz as we call him. Uh, he's written a number of books on the subject of Japanese baseball. He's done Issei Baseball, uh, Banzai Babe Ruth, and Mashi, the story of Masanori Murakami, among other subjects. But today he's going to be telling us more specifically about his newest book. It's an illustrated introduction to Japanese baseball cards. Uh, it's a very colorful book. It features over 200 images. It is for sale uh, in the bookstore. And after Rob's presentation here in the theater, uh, he'll be available to sign and personalize copies of the book um, as part of the signing in the atrium here. So please join me in welcoming to the author series, Rob Fitz. Rob, thanks, thanks for being with us. Good afternoon. All right. So today we're going to talk about the history of Japanese baseball cards, and we're going to mix in a little bit of Japanese history and Japanese baseball history as well. And I hope that you'll agree with me that these are probably the most beautiful cards ever produced. So from 1603 to 1853, Japan was a closed society. They had closed down their borders and they lived pretty much in isolation as a medieval feudal society. They had no team sports. The only organized sport they had was sumo and sumo had religious overtones. So it was, they didn't have the tradition of sports the way that we do in the Western world. Now in uh, 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry sails his black ships into Edo Bay and demands that Japan open up its borders to trade and also to Western settlement. And Japan sees the military might of Perry's small fleet and realizes how far behind they are of the European powers in terms of technology and what we call modern knowledge. So they decide they need to modernize quickly. And they do this by sending their best students abroad to the US and to Europe, and also importing American and European teachers to Japan. One of these teachers is a guy named Horace Wilson. And Horace Wilson is a baseball fanatic. And he comes over and in 1872, he brings out his baseball bat and ball at recess and teaches his Japanese students how to play baseball. And that is the beginning of Japanese baseball, or so the creation myth says. Now, 1872, is the, uh, this year is the 150th anniversary of Japanese baseball. So pretty soon, baseball is played in the elite high schools throughout Tokyo. But it didn't really take off until 1896. This team, the Ichiko High School, in 1896 defeats the adult American team from Yokohama, Yokohama Country Club in three straight games. And the kids in Ichiko become national celebrities overnight, and a baseball craze begins. Two years later, by 1898, almost every high school in Japan has a baseball team. And by 1906, Baseball is Japan's national pastime. Okay, so now we'll get back to the baseball cards. So Japanese baseball cards and American baseball cards differ in that for American baseball cards, the earlier cards were given away to help advertise other products. They're usually adult products such as tobacco. In Japan, baseball cards have mostly been kids' toys. 
This is the game of Menko. It's a very common uh, 19th and 20th century game. It's a flipping game, and it's a lot like the way American boys played with their baseball cards. So the first um, child would throw his card down on the surface. The next child would throw his card and either try to cover it or flip it over. If he succeeds, he keeps both, and they take turns until one is out of cards or has had enough. So in the 19th century, your first Menko are made out of clay. Then we start to have tin mango. But by the 1890s, we're getting cardboard. And earlier Menko are often military heroes or famous samurai. But soon we have baseball images. Now, as you can see, these early cards are very crude. Uh, they uh, depict generic players, not actual players. And today for the collector, they are very, very rare. Usually just about one copy of the cards I've just shown is known to exist. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be circular. They're made rectangular, Manco, and as we see later in the uh, 20th century, different shapes as well. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Manco are getting more colorful, more elaborate. And Manco uh, continue to be to exist, I think they exist today. But around 1900, a new fad hit Japan. That year, the Japanese government gave permission for private companies to produce postcards. Before then, all postcards were produced by the government. And that initiated a postcard craze in Japan. And you see them, basically every imaginable topic, there is a postcard from the early 20th century in Japan. So it didn't take long for baseball to become one of these topics. So if you're looking into Japanese cards between 1900 and about 1915, the vast majority of cards are postcards. Just an example, make it very colorful. They also start using action shots around 1906. And this stamp here shows the date of the game. And it shows that it's uh, Meiji University. Um, I guess Wasada University. And so they were sold as souvenirs. Now, obviously, you couldn't watch the game and come home with the card you attended, but you could buy them soon afterwards at the stadium. And you also get your first cards of actual players. Um, this is uh, Kaz Sugasa. He is the uh, best pitcher in Japan in the early 20th century. Uh, John McGraw called him the Christy Matthewson of Japan. And he went to Keio University. Um, and, but you see him show up when they play, uh, when the Japanese play American teams. He shows up for almost a decade, even though he's long past uh, graduating. Now, in 1906, American teams start coming to Japan. And they do this both to promote baseball and also to promote goodwill between Japan and the U.S. through the shared ties of baseball. And the, uh, the American teams were a popular um, subject for these postcards. This is the Reach All-American team. It went over in 1908. It's the first professional American team to go to Japan. And in all, there's over 100 teams, by the way, that come from the United States and travel to Japan before World War II. So this is John McGraw. He went there with uh, the New York Giants and Chicago White Sox in 1913. And colleges also started going over. University of Wisconsin, 1909. And Chicago in 1910. So in the 1920s and 1930s, college baseball is the pinnacle of Japanese baseball. They have no pro leagues yet, but tens of thousands of fans would come to Meiji Jingu Stadium, which we see here, to watch the top college matches. And the top college players were national celebrities. They're on front of newspapers, magazines, can't walk down the streets. And this leads to the first true Japanese baseball card. Menko become popular again. And these cards are what we call 
real baseball cards. So these are actual players. We have Nishimura over on the left, um, Kobashi in the middle, and I think this guy is Tabe on the right. Um, so they're all superstars of their time. This is what their backs look like. So the earlier Menko that I showed you from the 19th century were blank backed because they were just, just for flipping. These start to uh, have be collected by the kids. You can still flip them. So there's biographical information about the players on the back of these cards. And they come in different shapes. This uh, long and tall one is the size of a bookmark. It's about six inches tall. And this is a die cut Menko. And they also start to use black and white photographs on the front of Menko for the first time. Now, obviously, these are true players and not generic. Now, the black and white photographs leads to a new type of collectible called a bromide. Bromide are photographs produced on very cheap photographic stock, and it's meant as a keepsake. And they're sold either at the ballpark or in special stores that uh, specialize in bromides. And this is a Maribel store, and before COVID, it was still active in Tokyo. And you can go visit, and they sell, they're obviously new photographs, but they're reproduced from their old uh, stock and pictures. And we get uh, pinups inserted into magazines in the 1920s and 1930s. And our first baseball dice game. This one is an uncut sheet. You would cut out the players in the circles and you'd move them around the bases as you know as your dice told you to. Now in 1931 and 1934, um, Yomiuri newspaper brought over two MLB all-star teams. First one had uh, Mickey Cochran, Lefty Grove, Al Simmons, Blue Gehrig, the uh, second one, 1934, a little more famous, had Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox, Mo Berg. And these teams were the subject of a number of sets that were sold at the ballpark. Now, the most famous ball player, of course, of all time is Babe Ruth. And he was also depicted on the most Japanese baseball cards before World War II. So I thought it'd be fun to show you some different Japanese Babe Ruth cards. These all came out mostly in the 30s, but a few later. This is Retirement Day, Babe Ruth Day, came out in about 48, 49. Amenko. This is a later Amenko from 1950-ish. also from the early 50s. This is a postcard. It was taken uh, during the 34 tour. And the man with the beard is the most famous uh, tempura chef in all of Japan. And he was one of your early, there's no TV, of course, but he's one of your early celebrity chefs. Yeah. <laughs> and the babe. <laughs> Okay, so at the end of the tours, well, to play the 1934 um, MLB team, the Japanese get together an all-star team called the All-Nut Palm Team. It's sponsored by the Yomiuri newspaper. And the tour was such a success, the Yomiuri newspaper decides to keep their all-star team together, and they rename it the Tokyo Yomiuri Giants. And the Giants barnstorm across the United States for two years, and in 1936, we get the first successful Japanese professional league. But the next year, Japan invades China, and that eventually turns into World War II. So from 1937 through 1946, there are no known Japanese baseball card sets. So that means all your early pro superstars have no known cards. And those of us who collect are hoping someday we'll find one of these players in a card that has not been uh, cataloged yet. Well, at the end of the war, Japan, of course, is devastated. It's, our infrastructure is in tatters, the economy is in tatters, and they need to rebuild. U.S. occupation forces 
purposely used baseball to help rebuild Japan's morale and then also to help renew ties, friendly ties, between Japan and the U.S. They're very successful. And Japan becomes, uh, I'm sorry, baseball becomes more popular than ever. And it ushers in the golden age of Japanese baseball cards. And once again, in Japan, the cards are meant for kids to play with, not as collectibles at this time. We start to see hundreds of different Menko sets in the early, from the, about 1947 through about 1952. And most of these sets may have as few as six or a dozen cards, and some have a couple hundred. But they all concentrate on the Japanese superstars. You don't find any of uh, the bench players at this time. And as you might think, this is very reminiscent of the Whitlock prints you might see in Japan. And so they used styles on purpose that were uh, old, old styles. And also, if you've noticed on the uh, borders, see how uneven they are? That's because at that time, the Menko was sold in sheets like this, and the children would take scissors to cut out the individual cards. So if you're into grading cards, uh, they're very hard to find today, Japanese cards in top condition. Some, however, like this one, did come out of packs and were cut at the uh, company. This fellow's name is Victor Starfin. He was born in Russia, and his family escaped the Russian Revolution by coming first to China and then settling in Japan. And he became a pro baseball player in the beginning with the Yomiuri Giants in 1936. And he's the first person to win 300 games in Japan. And this is my favorite Victor Starfin card. It kind of looks like Ichabod Crane, I think. Now, during the late 40s and 50s, the backs of the Menko cards were used to play games. So here you see at the top, you see the rock, paper, scissors game. You see this number in the middle. That's not the card number. There were not uh, 1,345 cards in the set. That's just a number random number to be used in different games. And then bottom actually has the team name for the Hunchy Tigers. And it didn't have to be rectangular in the 1950s. There were lots of very attractive circular cards. Now, I'm not going to tell you who all these players are because they'll probably <laughs> Hard to explain in just a few minutes, but they're all Hall of Famers. I like this one. This is called a flying Menko. You see the notches on the side? The idea was to take a rubber band, put it in your uh, fingers like that, put the notch in the rubber band, and shoot it at your friends across the room. <laughs> And this is how Menko was sold, in a bundle like that, attached by string. Um, so either the stop, uh, shopkeeper might cut the string and sell them for a sen each, or they may sell the whole bundle. And we have die-cut Menko, also from the late 40s. This is Tetsuharu Kawakami. And his nickname was the God of Batting. He was the most feared hitter during the 1940s and 1950s. And very popular um, image on Menko. And this is my favorite set. I have one to pass around. This is a Menko mask. If you want to pass that around. Now, you'll see both on this picture and when it comes that the eyes can be removed and you can attach a string around it. So the idea is, of course, you can become Tetsuharu, Tetsuharu Kawakami, right? When you're playing stickball or whatever. So this, this set has about eight cards in it. It's, like I said, my, my favorite. It's called an airplane mango for obvious reasons. And 
they have Menko heights. This is about six by six inches. In the back. Okay, so starting in the late 40s, you get more dice games. And these dice games, you know, it's a lot like Stratomatic. You can see where you roll the die and the results. There are prizes for the New Year's issues of magazines. So it's a tradition uh, for the January issue of a magazine, especially one for kids, to have a toy in it of some kind. So they would have uncut sheets that would contain the starting nine or ten players from every team in the league. So just like playing Stratomatic or APBA, you could just uh, replay the league in your, in your home. There's Starfin again. Another example of a different dice game. It's also a game called Karuto. Now, Karuto is a traditionally a traditional match game, a memory game. What you do is you have a back card with biographical information or clues on it, and you have a picture card, and they're all face down. And I, we've probably all played that game where it's a memory game. You turn over one item at a card, card at a time, and you try to remember where the other one is. So this one, you have the clues as well. And I think they're, they're some of the most attractive sets made in Japan. These dates about 48 and 49, mostly. Not all of the crude sets were that attractive. <laughs> this Babe Ruth from 1950. And we see bromides come back in the 50s. Literally thousands of different sets sold all over the place. Most were black and white, cheaply produced. Some were colorized. This is Wally Yonamine. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. Wally was born in Hawaii. He played for the San Francisco 49ers football in 1947 the first Japanese and perhaps the first Asian to play in a future NFL franchise. And then in 1951, he went over to Japan and became the first major American star after World War II. So he's called the Jackie Robinson of Japan because he went through a fair amount of abuse because um, it was so soon after the war. And American teams continued to travel and barnstorm in Japan in the 1940s and 50s. So, of course, we have Yogi. 1955, the Yankees went over there. And some other players. Now, can anybody name these players? Bobby Shantz. Yes. In the middle. DiMaggio's. And Who's DiMaggio with? Anybody know? He's not in the Hall of Fame, but should be. Lefty <laughs> Odell. Yes, Lefty Odell. And on the right is... Yes, not on Montreal. So the occupation ends in 1952. And very strangely, this golden age of Japanese baseball cards in Menko ends as well. And the beautiful color cards you see earlier are gone. And instead they're replaced by the cards that looks like this. And American collectors call them tobacco Menko because they're a little bit bigger than a T206 card. The first ones were black and white and not terribly attractive. In a couple of years, though, we start to see these, uh, I think, very attractive uh, colorized versions of tobacco and tobacco. There are about a dozen different tobacco and manufacturers each year, and they sometimes produce multiple sets from 40 to several hundred. So it's basically impossible to collect them all. And there's no numbers on the back. So those of us who are really into Japanese baseball cards and do try to collect them all are constantly thinking, okay, I've got 100 different, that, that must be the set, and then we'll find a new one that will show up in auction. So no one knows how many are actually in the sets. And the backs are similar to the ones before, the games, rocks, paper, scissors, I don't know what the chicken's for. <laughs> Your number. This card says, who am I? And then it gives stats. It says he plays for the Yomiuri Giants. He's an outfielder. His number is one. He's a left-handed hitter. He bats left-handed, uh, throws left-handed. And I just can 
guess that that's Sada Harova. So Menko, when they're sold this time, they're sold for what's called a tava. I'm going to pass this around. So what these are, these are the packs. They're made out of newspaper, recycled newspaper. There's one card in each pack. And they're hung by a string at the store, and a kid would pull one out and get to keep it. So if you want to pass that around. So some of the cards are stamped on the back with either a one, a two, or a three. And these are known as prize cards. So that's where this comes in. This is a prize sheet. This would be hanging on the toy store's wall. And if you got a number three, you'd get to pick one of these pairs of pliers. If you got a number two, you get a four. And the ones that are missing are up here. I'll show you a picture of what's missing. These are full um, 12 to 16 card uncut sheets. So it'll give you about a third of the set often in one swoop. In the late 50s, we got two players in Japan that changed basically the history of Japanese baseball. This is Shigeo Nagashima. He's known as Mr. Giants. And until Ichiro came around, he was considered the greatest Japanese player of all time. And the next year, he had a teammate named Sadahara O, who, of course, is the all-time world home run champ. Now, people often ask, well, what is Sadahara O's rookie card? And if you remember what I was saying, there are over 12 manufacturers of Menko, and they're producing multiple sets every year. So, so far, we've cataloged at least 60 different Sadahara O rookies. So here are a few. And nobody, to my knowledge, has all 60. Some of them, there are only a few examples known. But the most sought after of the O rookies show Nagashima and O on the same card. And the two teamed up to hit three and four for the Omiri Giants. They're known as the O.N. Cannon. And between 1965 and 1973, they helped Yomiri capture nine straight Japan series. So the best team in Japanese history, one of the best baseball teams of all time. There's also Americans starting to go over in Japan in the 50s in numbers. And this is a fellow named Jack Bloomfield, who you've probably never heard of. Joe Stanka, he only played uh, part of one season in uh, the States, but went on to win the equivalent of the Japanese Cy Young. And on the right is a Cuban player who never played the States, named Chico Barbon. I'll show you Chico because Chico's rookie card, they were a little confused about him. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you're walking in Cooperstown and you happen to see this card for under $10,000, buy it. <laughs> you won't see one ever. <laughs> There's only a handful known to exist. All right, so I think uh, I told a few of you, we had a little bit of a glitch, unfortunately, in the presentation when uh, we were putting it together. So I'm going to have to show you the next few slides from the book. It's going to be hard for you to see. but. Awesome is Jackie Robinson, but two other very rare Menko Amer uh, cards of American players are Larry Doby and Don Newcomb. And they were teammates in 1962 for the Chonichi Dragons. And unfortunately, it was at the end of their careers, and they didn't do particularly well. In the 50s and 60s, we get gum cards. I'm not going to go into all the different sets, but there's just a few examples of them. Okay, so when I told you before that the Omiuri Giants win nine straight championships between 1965 and 1973, one would guess this would be the heyday of Japanese baseball cards, but it's not. Instead, there are fewer than 10 known sets for the whole period. No one knows why they weren't selling baseball cards. Maybe because there wasn't much challenge for the Giants. Maybe they, but baseball was still popular on TV. So I really don't know. 
There is one set, 1967, which you cannot see because um, of the missing slide, but it's called the Kabayo Leaf set, and it's a gum card set, and it's the most popularly collected Japanese cards in the United States, and they look a lot like the 1959 Tops. I can just hold up a picture so you can kind of see them. They're a very attractive set, right? So they have the one of the few Japanese cards of Masanori Murakami is in that set. All right, this is the last missing slide. So in 1973, the final year of um, the Omiro Giants' victories, there's a new set produced. And there's the example of it. And you'll see more of them in a second. It's a Calbee potato chip set. All right. So Calvi put one card in each bag of potato chips. This is obviously a later one. Um, and they produced sets from 1973 all the way until today. So the earlier sets contained about 400 cards. The 1975-76 set contained 1,400 different cards. Now, can you imagine how many potato chips you have to eat to get them all? <laughs> when I lived in Japan in 94, for, as an adult, I would go into these stores and buy stack cartloads of these potato chip bags. <laughs> and they were not tasty. So we used to have a joke <laughs> that if you came over as a guest in my apartment, you had to bring a shopping bag of potato chips back home with you. <laughs> I eventually just throw them out. <laughs> so that's actually, here's Sanahara O from the 1975-76 set. And as you can see, these are they're color action um, shots, they're on thick cardboard, they're beautiful cards. And they had inserts and rarities. This is a 1977 Hank Aaron of Sadahara O card, a very rare regional card. They're still producing today. Their style has changed through the time. But there's a few. I don't know if most of you know that Frank Howard played in Japan for one season. We have Reggie Smith up here. And other um, brands starting to mimic Calbee. So this is a Yamakatsu card. And I'm going to pass this around to you. Here's an envelope the card came from. This is their premium large size set. And there it is. Beautiful card. Um, Pass that around. It's, mm -hmm. You can see it's already bent, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but they're fairly common, but they're nice cards. Rob, is that Willie Davis? That's Willie Davis, yes. Here's Masanori Murakami. So starting in 1977, there's a dice game called Takara. And they produced all the way to 1997, I believe. And what's significant about this is previously, the Menko, the Calbi focused on star cards. But this set, they sold them in team sets. So you buy the Giants, you buy the Hawks, and it contained everybody on the roster at the time of printing. So for the, you're finally able to get the relief pitcher, your favorite relief pitcher, your favorite bench player, you know, your cousin's card, that kind of thing. So they're not that popular with collectors because they're not that attractive. But if you wanted to get a, sp a specific player, you go to your Takara cards. And in the 1980s and 90s, you get a lot of um, oddball cards. We have a gum wrapper here over in green. Uh, we have some stickers, different handouts, just kind of fun stuff. I was hoping we'd have some kids in the audience today. Sad that we don't, because I have Japanese cards for everybody. <laughs> so I'm going to just pass this box around. If you would like some, take one. Take a little. And if you don't, that's all right. We'll give them out to other kids <laughs> as they walk through the museum. So in 1991, we get the first truly modern Japanese set. This is BBM Baseball Magazine. And they produce a card set with numbers on the back, with full statistics on the back. They have checklist cards, league leader cards. And they change the market. 
There's the back of the no more rookie. That's important. Oh, yeah, I see that. BBM still dominates the market today. They now produce multiple sets every year. They have your game use cards, your autograph cards, your insert cards, everything that they do here, BBM does as well. And I'm going to end my talk with just some examples of some of the most popular cards right now. So to, if you're an investor or a really crazy Japanese card collector, you may want the rookies of the guys who've come over. So here's some of the better ones. Hideo Nomo, of course Ichiro, Yu Darvish, and I think it's fitting to end with Otani. So I hope you have some questions. We don't have to talk just about Japanese baseball cards. If you want, to have, want a question about Japanese baseball, feel free. Chris. Yeah, in the more like modern sets like, like this, do we see comparisons with like American sets where they're going to be special edition like series? Like I know like, the World Baseball Classic means a lot more in Japan than it does here. So are there like World Baseball Classic cards and like All Star cards, or is it more like generalized just towards teams? We have All Star cards, and there's what they call nostalgic cards. You know, cards show players from the 50s and 60s. They don't have World Baseball Classic cards because of the licensing issues. But um, So I would love to see cards of the American teams that come over there. But they don't do that because of the licensing. But yeah, they, they do a, a whole bunch of different sets now. Yes. Do you want to, Bruce, do you want to yeah. do that? <laughs> right there in the back. So in Japan, even today, um, companies own the their major league teams. So the earlier ones were newspapers, train lines would often own them, department stores might own them, and that goes today. Of course, now we're talking about big software companies, um, you know, car manufacturers, things like that. But one of the problems Japan had, especially during the 80s and early 90s, was because big uh, corporations would own the baseball teams. The baseball team's budget and um, income were small compared to the big corporations. So it was used more of advertising. So if your team, as long as it was getting people in and their, t their, their games were on television, you didn't care if they won or lost. It didn't really matter. And it's only now that things are really getting, I think, more pumped up. They're starting to sell more memorabilia, that they're starting to get more money out of. Uh, one of the most intriguing things about Japanese baseball that I found is they use a smaller baseball. How do you think that impacts judging their performance when you know you're coming from Japan over to the United States? Yeah, it, it depends on the player, but it definitely impacts if the players talk about the pitchers talk about not having a proper grip or having to redevelop their grip. Um, it's it's, they call it a skin smaller. So it, I don't think it's going to affect the hitters much. Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking millimeters. Mm -hmm. But for the pitchers, especially um, you know, the, grip. Oh, yeah, the grip of curveballs and stuff might be off a little bit. Yeah, um, I have come across articles on some of the earlier tours where the Americans were complaining and saying, we can't throw this baseball. They also used to make them in cal well, cowhide in Japan, not horsehide. And they said, we can't get a good grip. So they come up with a compromise that the team in the field would play with their national national mm -hmm. baseball. Mm -hmm. Rob, I was curious if companies like Tops and Fleer have they ever done Japanese cards? Tops and Upper Deck have. As a matter of fact, there's an Upper Deck card. Mm -hmm. Yep, in, in the <laughs> set that I gave out. Um, the Upper Deck only lasted two years. Uh, Tops has come out with a couple, and I. Last year, actually, Tops came out with an all Japanese player set, only sold in Japan. Um, I actually haven't seen the cards yet. They were very expensive. Do they, so, um, sorry, do they when they first started, did they use the, were the rules very similar to they didn't try to 
um, deviate from the rules at all? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the rules have always been similar, but they played them like kind of with their own style. So mm -hmm. in Japan, um, up until very recently, small ball was still very popular. Lots of bunting, hits and runs, um, more stolen bases in, during certain times. Um, fewer home runs, obviously. So, and they also invert strike and balls until very recently. But other than that, the rules are basically the same. Yeah. Ian. So I remember at one point saying that there was like a bunt contest. Uh, is that still a thing in Japan? <laughs> I've never heard of the bunt contest, but I can imagine it, yeah. When I was in Japan, my favorite player was a shortstop for the Yomiri Giants, and he I think he reached 1,000 sacrifice bunts. I'm not, I could be, maybe it was 500, but I'm making up the number, right? And it was a big deal. It was the front of the paper. He, he went out, they interrupted the game, he signed the ball, you know, he got a big trophy. I just can't imagine, other than the few people who work in this building, how many people know the all time bunt leader? We have someone here had a hand up. Yes, sir. So, with the you know internet and eBay, are you? You're seeing a significant increase in value of the vintage Japanese cars. Yeah, yeah, sadly. Um, <laughs> I actually started a business, um, an online business selling Japanese baseball cars in 1999, and uh, I, I kind of did it, used my profits to buy more cars. And since COVID, well, first of all, as you may know, at the very beginning of COVID, car prices just dropped because people were like, all right, we're going to be here next month. I don't know. And then, two or three months into it, everything skyrocketed. And now, I can't buy more stock. I, I mean, I, I do a lot of Japanese auctions, and I buy myself and I import it, and I'm outbid on everything. And um, I've sold off most of my stock way too cheaply. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy right now. And a Sadahara O rookie card, which probably gone about $2,000 Five years ago, it's just sold for twenty-five thousand dollars. So yeah, they're really being bumped up. Any other questions for Rob? What's like your yes. most prized card that you have? Like the one that you look at and you're always like, I love this card. It doesn't have to be the most expensive card. Sure. Just like sure. Wow, that's, like, that's a good one. Like best story. I have two. One is the Jackie Robinson card that I was lucky enough mm -hmm. to get before many years ago. Before people really valued it. Um, the other one is a good story for me. I bought when I was 10 years old at a Philadelphia sports car show, back in the days where the Philadelphia sports car show was the show. That we didn't have, we had one a year, that's it. This is like 1975, 76. And I'm going through the penny box, because that's what everything cost back then, and there was a Japanese baseball card. And I was like, what is this? I have never heard of Japanese baseball. And so I just bought it. And I stuck it in my, my little old binder. We, we used, back then we used Polaroid binders, you know, for the Polaroid cards. Yeah. So there's no sports card industry. Um, and it wasn't until I moved to Japan in 1993 that I actually figured out what it was. And it was uh, one of these tobacco mango colorized by a guy who was a Hall of Fame pitcher named Fujita. So, yeah, that's kind of my favorite card. I still have it in case. You know, you like my set in case. <laughs> we'll take one last question from Chris. Yeah, so uh, you passed around the, the, the kind of cards that like you, they used to hang in the stores and kids would pull them. For, like, for the most part, you mentioned Topps had, had a set last year. Are they packaged similarly? Or, like, and is the distribution process similar in terms of like where it's sold or like, how it's sold, the, the amount it's sold? Mm -hmm. So starting with the BBM sets of 1991, they started being in these um, foil packs in a box. Where they sell them differently is in the early 90s, you had to go to a bookstore to buy baseball cards. And that's where they were sold. They were taxed to like books, printed material. And at the time when I was there in 93, there was only one Japanese baseball card store. And luckily it was a mile from I <laughs> believe that. <laughs> um, now there's more Japanese baseball card stores. They don't deal in vintage cards over there, though. The, the, all the people who really sell them are in the States. Um, but if you want modern Japanese cards, you go there.
tops, I think, sold most of theirs pre-order. I think you have to go through websites to buy them. We want to thank Rob Fitz for uh, leading us through a very insightful and entertaining talk about the history of Japanese baseball cards. We're going to head out into the atrium of the library in just a moment. Rob will be available to sign copies of his new book, which is an illustrated introduction to Japanese cards. He's also brought with him his first book, and you can tell folks a little bit about that. Uh, so we have a few of those copies available as well, and obviously Rob can sign those. Tell us about that first book that you did, Rob. The first book's called Remembering Japanese Baseball. I'm sure most of you have uh, come across Glory of Their Times. It's my favorite baseball book. And so I wanted to do a oral history just like Glory of the Times with Japanese baseball players. So back in the early 2000s, I started interviewing people. I interviewed about 30 players, and I think 20 of them made it into the book. And it's interviews told from their perspective, edited as if they were sitting down next to you or having a beer and telling you about their life and about Japanese baseball. So it's not me going, and then what did you do, you know, author response. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like them just talking essays. Um, so it's a great way to learn Japanese baseball history because I started with players who played in the late 40s all the way up to about 2000. I get them to tell you about their experience and also the guys they played against. So it's like a painless way to get to become a history expert. Yeah. Robin, thank you. Great job. Man.